Brilliant. So let's go. You alluded to the fact that we would talk about the difference between low carb and low fat. And I think for the, we know that for the majority of people living with diabetes, you're sort of bombarded with these two messages, right? There's a whole bunch of people, there's, there's, there's scientific information that says eat a low carbohydrate diet. Then there's testimonials from people that say eat a low carbohydrate diet. Then on the opposite side, there's, there's scientific justification for eating a low fat diet. And there's also testimonials as well. So the average person is just caught in between and they say, well, I don't, I don't know what to do. Maybe they'll try one, they'll try another, they might not do it properly, et cetera, et cetera. So can you go into a little detail here about if you were living with diabetes and you knowing what you know, okay, what, what would you recommend as far as like, what is the danger of a low fat diet? What is the danger of a low carbohydrate diet? And what are the benefits of the two of those? Okay. Well, knowing what I know, if I got type two diabetes, you say, I'm not doing what I know. So I wouldn't get it. <laughs> um, when I talk to people, I like to say, I understand why the low carb message is so compelling and why the, result, the results show what they show. If we just look at glucose or sometimes insulin levels and weight, a low carb diet works. But it's, it's not just what you see, is, is it just the weight loss that matters? Or specific levels of insulin and glucose? Or is the overall health? So a low carb works, but I'm not saying it's the best way. And I'm gonna then explain why it is so. So the analogy that I like to give is this. Um, I say, think about a sink. So you have a large sink with two faucets, correct? So, and let's say that when you open the faucet, the water comes out, the water would be the glucose you can, you're getting from your food, correct? So, so you open one faucet, so you're getting glucose into your system and it's coming into the sink and the glucose, which is the water, goes through the drain correct? So the drain would be then um, the main brain of a cell and the holes that you have in the drain would be the channels that allow the glucose to go into the cells. And that's the way you want to. Glucose comes into a bloodstream and then it gets picked up by cells, primarily by muscle cells, but also can be picked up by liver cells, but primarily uh, the muscles are going to be clearing the excess glucose from the system. So that would be the ideal system. You open the faucet, so you're eating something, glucose is coming out, and it's going through the drain, and then you close. When you eat a lot of refined carbohydrates, it would be like open the two faucets at the same time. So you're getting glucose coming out and a lot of volume. The volume is very big. So you can have a little bit of accumulation at the bottom, but it's still gonna go through. It's not the ideal way of eating carbohydrates, so we would prefer whole grains or whole carbohydrates. Um, when you talk about whole carbohydrates, just, uh, I don't like to talk about complex or whole. For people to understand, we like to say either intact versus stripped, because what it matters is carbohydrates with fiber, okay? So when you talk about complex or whole carbohydrate or whole grains, what we're saying is a carbohydrate attached to fiber, which means intact carbohydrate. So if you open one faucet, it would be the equivalent of eating intact carbohydrates. The amount of, carbo of glucose that comes in goes easily through the drain. If you eat stripped carbohydrates, it would be the equivalent of opening two faucets, and now open two faucets, the amount is a lot but you can, still make, you can still go through the drain. But what happens if the drain has hair in it? It won't go, right? So if the drain has hair and now you open one faucet, it's gonna be hard, but it makes you go. But if you open two faucets, nothing is gonna happen. Now you're gonna have accumulation. So that's what happened with the American diet 
or I don't, I don't like to say American Western diet. No, it's not just blamed Americans. <laughs> Brazilians are getting very close to that too. Uh, what, that's, what, that, that's what the Western diet is. It's massive amount of stripped carbohydrates, so carbohydrates without fiber, and a clogged drain. What is the clogged drain? The hair in the drain is the fat in a diet. The more fat we have in a diet, specifically the more saturated fat we have in a diet, the more the drain is clogged. So if we have a low carb diet, would be the equivalent of letting the sink alone and closing the faucet. Will it work? Of course it will. You're not opening the faucet. <laughs> so you're not gonna have accumulation of water. You're not gonna have accumulation of glucose. That's why low carb works. You're just refusing to open the faucet. But is that what you wanna do? No, you wanna be able to use the sink. So what you have to do is unclog the drain. And the way you do it is by removing excess fat from your diet, specifically saturated fat. Once you unclog the drain, you can open the faucet as much as you want, the water will go in. And of course, if you're smart and you choose intact carbohydrates, you never have accumulation. So that's the analogy I like to use. And then people sort of understand because saturated fat is uh, it's what is blocking um, glucose from being uptaken by the muscle cells. So at the beginning, you may have... Um, so because basically that's what we would describe as insulin resistance. So you produce enough insulin, but the cell is not seeing the insulin and the glucose accumulates. But once the fat is removed, the insulin resistance clears and you don't have this problem. And just to make the point a little further, it has already been shown that people that follow a low carb diet, they do lose weight, but the insulin resistant that resistance is still exists in the muscle cells, meaning outside they look great, but the muscles still are not uptaking the glucose. So the metabolic condition still exists, even though they lost some weight. That's really, really important right there, that information, because it's so confusing. And so to understand how, you know, the, the biology that we're talking about can explain both approaches is is really good and that makes sense why we can choose to follow a low fat diet yeah there's, there's another reason um this is like the molecular explanation but there's a, a simpler one and it has to do with calorie density i think you had someone that you already interviewed at the specific talk about uh, calorie density i don't have to go into that uh, but if we compare the caloric intake of Americans from 1970 up until now, there is this myth that Americans have been following a low fat diet for all of these decades and that didn't work. And because of that, the answer is to follow a low carb diet. The problem is that this is nothing but a myth because um, if we compare, so in 1970, the average caloric intake of the American was around 2,000 calories. And now in 2010, it was around 2,500 calories. So it's 500 calories more a day compared to 40 years ago. So that alone can explain why Americans are overweight and it's just the amount of calories alone. But if we break, let's break it down. If we break it down into sugars and grains that they like to really um, blame for the epidemic of diabetes and obesity, what happens is sugar compared 1970 to 2010 increased about 10%. And sugar intake is actually decreasing in the US. The peak was in 1999 and is being steadily going down. So sugar intake has been going down and people are still getting overweight and they're still getting type 2 diabetes so sugar is not to blame even though stripped sugar shouldn't be our main uh, nutrient in a diet 
Um, when it comes to sugar, I always talk, people um, like to talk, should you avoid sugar? No, it's not about avoiding, it's about reducing, it's about limiting your consumption. And what would be this limit? It would be 5% of your caloric intake. So if you eat um, 2,000 calories, like women is about 1,500 to 1,800 calories, men 2,000 calories. So then 5% would be about what? Um, 100 calories a day, which is not a lot. It would be like one tablespoon or two tablespoon of something if you wanted to add. So that, that's the, the sugar. But I, going back to the point I was trying to make, when it comes to grains, because now everybody likes to, to blame grains for um, the obesity and type two diabetes crisis or epidemic that we have in the US. Um, between 1970 and 2010, there was an increase of 40% of the consumption of grains. So there was an increase of 40%, but 90% of Americans eat strip carbohydrates. So grains, they don't have any fiber. So they're eating refined carbohydrates, white flour, white bread, and all of that. But when it comes to the amount of fats and oils in the diet, the increase has been almost 70%. So we are comparing an increase of 40% in stripped carbohydrate plus an increase of 70% in the amount of fat and oils. So the increase has been larger in the amount of fat than grains, but it's still the type of carbohydrates that has increased has been the one that we don't want. And so when, when it comes to the obesity and the type two diabetes epidemic in the US, it's both. It's, I don't like to blame just fats because carbohydrates play a role, but only strip carbohydrates, not whole grains, like we discussed before. Um, even when we are discussing, remember when we talk about the transcription factor, the TCF702, um, which is the one mutation associated with higher risk of type 2 diabetes, we saw that the more whole grains in the diet, the less likely someone will develop type 2 diabetes. So it's carbohydrate without fiber, which is our main concern, not with fiber. But again, having guidelines in the US saying, you should follow a low fat diet. It's different than actually following a low fat diet. So Americans have not been following a low car, uh, fat diet. And even if they were, they were probably going to be following what Americans consider low fat, which is 30 to 35%. And we had this discussion before, it's not low fat. So that's why we have this confusion. Um, at least our students at UC Davis, hopefully the ones that take my class, one make won't be making this this mistake again. <laughs>